Hi everyone, in this video we're going to find an expression for the inductance per unit length of a pair of parallel wires. So that's what I've shown in the diagram up at the top left, and as you can see, uh, we've got two identical wires, each of them has a radius of A, we're going to assume they have a cylindrical shape or a circular cross section, and the centers of the wires are separated by a distance of D. Now we're going to assume throughout that A is much less than D, as I've written down there, um, however, I've also written in the sort of problem statement there that we have to include the internal contribution. So what I mean by that is that um, because of the current flowing through the wires, there will be some flux uh, going through the region between the wires, but there'll also be some flux going through the wires themselves. That's what I mean by the internal contribution. It's the contribution to the inductance of the flux that is sort of threaded through the wires themselves. Now just because A is much less than D doesn't mean we should necessarily ignore that and it'll become quantitatively clearer later on why we can't just ignore that contribution. So let's start just by defining what we mean by inductance. So inductance is the flux linkage phi per unit current like that. I'm saying flux linkage rather than just flux and the distinction between those two quantities is going to become very important um, later on. But just bear in mind that that phi is really flux linkage. Now I've written my current as i here. Let me add that onto the diagram. Um, we're going to have a current of i flowing up uh, through the, the wire on the left. In reality, these two wires would be part of a circuit. So carrying an electrical signal from one place to another, for example. And so the current realistically would be flowing in opposite directions in the two wires. So I'm going to put my current, the same current I, flowing down through the wire on the right hand side. So in order to split the problem into more approachable chunks, I'm going to split the diagram up into three separate spatial regions. So we're going to have region one being basically the region inside the first wire, the wire on the left. Region two is going to be the region between the two wires and region three is going to be uh, inside the second wire on the, the right hand side. The reason for doing that is then we can say that our total flux linkage is just the sum of the flux linkages in each of the different regions. So phi is phi1 plus phi2 plus phi3 and then we can think about how to work each of those out individually. Now because magnetic flux is a surface integral of magnetic field or magnetic flux density we are going to need um, to know what the magnetic field produced by a wire actually is. Um, so let me just make a note of this up at the top right. So we're going to try and find the magnetic field due to a wire. And in order to do that, we need to set up a coordinate system. So I'm just going to define, let's say this line I'm drawing on the diagram there is the center of the wire on the left. We just define a coordinate pointing radially outwards from that center of the wire, and we call that R. Um, and by symmetry, the field line is due to one wire are going to wrap around in circles uh, around the, the wire that's producing that field. So you can use Ampere's law to find expressions for the field. I'm not going to go through that in a huge amount of detail because I'm assuming if you're watching this video you probably already know how to use Ampere's law. Um, so if we, if we apply Ampere's law, firstly when R is bigger than A, in other words when we are outside um, the wire on the left, and again, we're considering the wires separately for the time being, we'll combine them together later. Uh, your mu naught times current enclosed term is just mu naught i, because if you circulate all the way around the wire, you've enclosed the entire current. And that's going to be the line integral of magnetic field, but by symmetry the magnetic field is constant um, on a well, along a circular path. So we just get 2 pi r times b, and therefore your flux density b is mu naught i over 2 pi r. If we apply Ampere's law when r is less than a, in other words when we are within the wire itself, it's mostly the same but your mu naught times current enclosed bit, you have to think a bit carefully about because you're now not enclosing all of the current um, when you circulate around and do your, your line integral. And so instead of just mu naught i, you have to know how much current you are encircling we can make the assumption that the current is uniformly distributed for the time being uh, through the wire. If it's uniformly distributed, then you have to multiply by a fraction of pi r squared over pi a squared 
because that's the fraction of the area that you encircle um, when you do a little loop around your, uh, your circle of radius r. Uh, the right-hand side of this Ampere's law equation is still the same. It's still just the line integral 2 pi rb. And then you go through and simplify all of that, and you get b is mu naught i r over 2 pi a squared, right? If some of that didn't make sense and you would like me to do a video on Ampere's law, then let me know and I can do that. But for now, let's proceed and start doing some integration. Now, the easiest region to start with is region 2. So let's find phi 2, the flux linkage, due to region 2. Um, now, so, okay, magnetic flux is the surface integral of your field B. The flux linkage you can basically think of as the number of turns multiplied by the magnetic flux itself. Now, the problem with this term, number of turns, is that it makes you think of coils because if you have a, a coil of wire, then the, the word turn has a simple interpretation. But here we've got parallel wires. Uh, the current is just going up one wire, down the other wire. So it's not obvious what we mean by turns. So let's just take a moment to, to think about that. Now, remember we said that these parallel wires are really part of a circuit. So what's going to happen is eventually the current will go to its destination up at the top somewhere. And it's going to have to travel through a circuit from left to right overall uh, so that it can come back down the wire on the right hand side. Then when it comes back to its source, it's going to have to go through a circuit. Uh, come overall from the right to the left so they can go back through um, the wire on the left hand side. So we do actually have ultimately a circulation of current as we do in any circuit, it's just it doesn't look like it when we only focus on part of the wires. Now for region 2, that loop that your current forms, formed by those four arrows that we've got representing where the current is going, the entire current encircles region two, right? When it does, when the current does one full loop around um, your, your circuit, the whole of region two is encircled by that current. What that basically means is that we have one full turn. And so in this case, magnetic flux is the same as magnetic flux linkage. So we don't really have to worry about the distinction between those things when we are considering region two because the entire current encircles region two. Let's also be clear on what our area element is. So we can, I think the most natural choice of area element is to have a little infinitesimal rectangle. Um, I'm just drawing this at the tip of this R arrow here, because this area element is going to be at a distance of R from the center of the first wire. It's going to have a thickness of dr. Let me just write that down there. And it's going to have a length of one because we are considering the inductance per unit length, right? So we can consider our area element to have a, a length of one. So then using the fact that flux is just the surface integral of field, let's set up our integral. We are gonna get the integral from a to d minus a, right? That's the range of our coordinates that defines region two. Um, we're outside both of the wires, so we need the b equals mu naught i over 2 pi r expression, which applied when r was bigger than a. So I'm going to put here mu naught i over 2 pi r. Your area element is just dr times 1 because it's that red rectangle, so we just put a dr there. Now, we have so far only considered the field due to one wire. To, to add the contribution of the second wire, you can basically just multiply this whole thing by 2 because the whole situation is symmetrical, right? If you use the right hand rule, you should be able to convince yourself that the field due to both of the wires is pointing into the screen um, in region two. And so the wires are going to contribute identical amounts of flux. So we just put a two there. Then we can do the integral, um, take out a constant factor of mu naught i over pi. The twos will cancel and you integrate one over r, you get the natural log of r. We evaluate that at a and d minus a. And using the fact, well, using properties of logarithms, um, we end up with uh, mu naught i over pi times natural log of d minus a over a. Now, at this point, we can apply the approximation that we made at the very beginning, where a is much less than d. Now, if a is much less than d, then d minus a 
is basically the same thing as just d, and so we can say this is roughly equal to mu naught i over pi times natural log of just d over a. So that is the flux linkage contributed um, by region 2. So we also, of course, need expressions for phi 1 and phi 3. The first thing I'm going to say about those is that by symmetry, phi 1 and phi 3 should be equal. There's no difference between the two wires. Um, and so they should contribute equal amounts of flux linkage. So the flux linkage due to the field going through wire, the wire on the left, is equal to the flux linkage due to the field going through the wire on the right. So we can imagine that we're just finding the flux linkage due to the wire on the, the left to start with. Um, this is a little bit conceptually harder than the flux linkage through region 2. And I'm going to start by doing it slightly incorrectly and then explain why we have to make an adjustment. Because I think that'll, that'll be the clearest way to do this. So if we start setting up our integrals, um, well, we're this time integrating from 0 to 8, because that's the range of R coordinates that defines region 1. Um, we get a contribution to this flux linkage from the field produced by the wire on the left going through itself. And because that's the internal field, we need this mu naught ir over 2 pi a squared expression. So my integrand this time is just going to be mu naught ir over 2 pi a squared. The area element is still dr. Again, this is not quite right, but I'm going to explain what we have to fix uh, in a few moments. Um, Firstly, I want to say that we do have to add on a second contribution, which is the integral from 0 to a again, but we have to consider the fact that there's some magnetic field coming from the wire on the right, which is then threading through the wire on the left. And so you need to use the mu naught i over 2 pi r expression, the mu naught i over 2 pi, but the r is not really an r, it's actually d minus r, because you need the distance from the center of the wire on the right to uh, your particular radius r, right? So that is the field coming from the wire on the right going through the wire on the left. Um, and then our area element is still dr. However, here is where we have to think very carefully about the distinction between flux and flux linkage, because what we've written down there is the magnetic flux through region one and through region three, but that differs subtly, uh, but importantly, from the flux linkage. So let me try and explain what's going on here. Um, firstly, let me draw on another area element. This time I'm going to draw an area element inside wire, uh, the wire on the left. Let's put our area element there. Um, and again, it has a width of dr and a height of 1. But the complication arises because the current is spatially distributed over some finite area. It's not all just going through the very center of the wire. We've made the assumption that it's uniformly distributed throughout the wire. So imagine building up your cylindrical um, wire out of annulus shaped elements. I'm going to draw in um, a sort of core of the wire. Let me just let me do that as a rectangle like this. So imagine we've got some small core of the wire in the center there, which just touches the blue rectangle through which we are considering the flux. Now all of the current which is going through that region, which I am now trying to shade, all of the current which is going through that little core of the wire there is going to be encircling the blue rectangle when it does a full loop around that uh, the, the circuit that we were describing earlier. Right? Remember we've got these four arrows where the current goes up and then to the right and then down and then to the left. So when you're the, the core of your cable, the current going to the core of that cable does that full loop, it's definitely encircling the blue rectangle. And so all of the current in that core is linked to the flux going through the blue rectangle. What about the current which is at larger radii than the blue rectangle itself? What I mean by that is this little bit which I'm now shading in orange. Well, the current element um, which is going through that outer part of the wire there is not actually going to be encircling. If you imagine following that current element as it goes all the way around its loop, it's not going to be encircling the blue rectangle. And therefore, the current in that sort of outer part of the wire is not actually linked with the flux to the blue rectangle. So only part of the current through each wire is linked to the flux 
within that wire because not all of the current encircles all of the flux when it does a full loop around. But that's conceptually the hardest part of the video to understand, I think. So just, just take a moment to, to try and understand that. So how do we actually take account of that mathematically? Well, I'm going to make a bit of space because we're going to have to add a term into each of these integrals. Now, remember I said earlier that flux linkage can be thought of as a number of turns multiplied by uh, the flux itself. So here what's going on is that instead of like a coil type situation where you have multiple turns and therefore all of the current is linked to your flux more than one time, here you really have a fractional turn because only some fraction of the current is actually linked to each um, element of, of flux within each wire. Now the fraction of the current which is linked to a particular flux element is going to be the same as this pi r squared over pi a squared um, that we had to that we had to take account of when we were finding the internal field of a wire. So basically I need this factor here pi r squared over pi a squared as like a fractional term to account for the fact that only a certain fraction pi r squared over pi a squared of the current in the wire is linked to that particular flux element and by exactly the same reasoning you need the same factor times pi r squared over pi a squared. Um, notice that especially in, particularly in this first integral we've overall multiplied by two factors of pi r squared over pi a squared which might seem a little bit strange but remember that those factors appear for different reasons. Right? The first one was from Ampere's law because we were not encircling the whole of the current and the second factor is because not all of the current is actually linked with the flux element that we're considering. So now all we've got to do is actually evaluate these integrals. Um, we can fortunately take out a lot of constant terms. This first integral you can take out a factor of mu naught i over 2 pi a to the 4. Then the integral itself just becomes r cubed dr from 0 to a. The second integral the constant factor that you can take out is mu naught i over 2 pi a squared and then the integrand um, is r squared over d minus r uh, with respect to r. Now this first integral is easy because integrating r cubed gives you r to the 4 over 4 then you just plug in a and you get a to the 4 over 4 so what's going to happen is that this a to the 4 will cancel with the a to the 4 that you get when you integrate and then the over 4 will combine with that 2 to give you an over 8 and so your first term is going to be mu naught i over um, 8 pi overall. Now the second integral, um, you can actually do that integral in full but we can save ourselves a bit of work by noting that remember um, a is supposed to be much less than d and so our integral here is roughly equal to the integral from 0 to a of r squared over d dr. The reason is that we're integrating from 0 to a in terms of r, so r itself is always less than a, therefore r itself is always much less than d, so d minus r is approximately the same as d. Now when you integrate this you just get a cubed over 3d now, when you multiply that with the prefactor, you had a 1 over a squared, an a squared on the bottom in your prefactor. That a squared will combine with the a cubed on the numerator of what we got when we integrated. And overall, your second term then is proportional to a over d. Right? That entire second term is proportional to a over d. a over d, however, due to our assumption, is much less than 1. And so that second term is going to be very small compared with the first term. So we can neglect it and just change that equals into a roughly equals. If you go through the whole process of doing this integral, um, you'll get a couple of terms including a logarithm and then you can do a Taylor expansion and come to exactly the same conclusion. But that's more work than, than what we need to do here. Maybe I'll do another video on that just for fun, just to see how um, you get the same result regardless of when you do the approximation. But let's just keep this as approximately mu naught i over 8 pi. This also explains what I was saying at the very um, beginning about the fact that just because a is much less than d that doesn't mean we should ignore the contribution of the internal flux because we got this mu naught i over 8 pi which is actually a constant and doesn't depend on how big 
the radius a is compared with the separation d, right? And so that mu naught i over 8 pi term is not negligible regardless of how narrow the, the y's are. So the very final step is just to add together all of the fluxes, phi 1, phi 2, phi 3, and divide by the current to turn it into an inductance. You're going to arrive at the conclusion that your inductance per unit length, remember, is roughly equal to mu naught i over pi, um, because you've got a mu naught i over pi in your phi 2, and you've got the same factor in each of phi 1 and phi 3. However, we've got to get rid of this i, remember, because that's part of the definition, definition of inductance, it's flux linkage per unit current. So we've got a mu naught over pi. Um, then we get a factor of natural log of d over a from the phi 2, that first integral that we did. Um, and then you're going to get plus an eighth from this term here, from each of phi 1 and phi 3. You've got two of those, so that's overall a quarter. So we do plus um, a quarter here. So here's your expression for your inductance per unit length of your parallel wires. Final thing to say is um, let's think about what would happen if your current was not uniformly distributed across the cross section of your wires, because we've assumed throughout a uniform distribution um, of that current. This is not always true. This is it'll be a good approximation if you have um, a direct current or if you have a low frequency alternating current. If you have high frequency alternating current, then you get this thing called the skin effect, which means that the current predominantly flows um, very close to the outer edge of your conductor. And so if you if you have a high frequency alternating current, this expression is not really valid um, because our assumption of um, the uniform distribution of current is not valid. Um, however, we can fix that pretty easily by noting that uh, if you don't have current in the interior part of your wire, then you're not going to have much magnetic field in that interior part of the wire. Because when you do your Ampere's law integral, if you're not encircling any current, then that there's no current to produce the field. And so the conclusion of all of that would basically be that the internal contribution to the inductance um, becomes more and more negligible. And this one quarter um, would, would just vanish. And so it's actually a better approximation uh, to leave off the factor of one quarter if you need to account for the skin effect because you've got high frequency alternating currents. So anyway, thank you for watching. Um, I hope this has been interesting and that the video has gone some way towards clarifying the distinction between flux and flux linkage and why it's important to uh, carefully distinguish between the two. And I hope to see you again soon.